हेलो एंड वेलकम टू अन अकेडमी वन स्टॉप डेस्टिनेशन फॉर ऑल द इंग्लिश मीडियम सिविल सर्विस एस्पिरेंट्स वेलकम टू अनदर सेशन ऑफ इकोनॉमी वीकली रीकैप वेर इन वी टेक अप ऑल द इंपॉर्टेंट इकोनॉमी आर्टिकल्स विच हैव अपियर्ड इन द लास्ट वन वीक एंड एनालाइज दोज आर्टिकल्स एंड फॉर दिस वीक दिस इज अ लिस्ट ऑफ द इंपॉर्टेंट आर्टिकल्स लेट मी स्टार्ट विद द फर्स्ट वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट आर्टिकल द बैंक्स गेट रेडी to count credit card expenditure in lrs what are the important points point number 1 lrs basically stands for liberalized remittances scheme lrs was introduced back in the year 2004 and under lrs all the individuals in india such as you and me annually we are allowed to take out 250000 dollars out of india either under the capital account transactions of bop or current account transactions under bop for example i can take out these dollars to invest in a foreign market i can take out these dollars for educational expenditure healthcare expenditure etc now over a period of time there was a concern that was raised by government of india the concern was the credit card expenditures the credit card expenditures were not included as a part of lrs expenditure now what do you mean by this imagine i have a credit card i'm sitting in usa i will keep on using the credit card to make certain payments these expenses were not counted earlier as a part of the lrs expenditure and as a result of this many of the banks started issuing credit cards with a very high amount of limit even beyond Two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And second concern is, whenever you spend money outside India, it will basically lead to outflow of dollars. So government of India was concerned even about the free outflow of these dollars, which are not being counted as a part of LRS. Point number four. Many of you will ask me, sir, you say that I can take out two hundred fifty thousand dollars annually. What if I want to take out more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars? Is it allowed? Of course yes it is allowed now you'll have to take the approval or the permission of Reserve Bank of India if you're going to take out under LRS you don't require any permission if you cross this particular limit you will have to take the permission of Reserve Bank of India now take into consideration all these factors government of India now says whatever expenditure you will incur outside India whenever you use a credit card to make a payment even those expenses will be counted as a part of lrs these shall be collected whenever you spend the money these shall be collected the information regarding this shall be collected by the banks and then the information shall be provided to the authorities now these are certain important points in addition to this there is one more concept associated with the lrs which is there in the discussion recent times which is also mentioned in the article provided here the discussion is regarding the concept of tax collection at source tc yes this is a fifth point from the article that i want you people to understand now what is this tcs very important point there is one more term called as a tds many of you will be confused between tcs and tds and many of you will simply say sir tcs is name of a company in india my dear i am not talking about a company i am talking about exchange market i am talking about lrs etc tcs stands for tax collection at source tds stands for tax deduction at source the basic difference is tcs is applicable whenever whenever you will purchase something the seller will impose and collect taxes from you and tds is applicable whenever you are earning income part of your income which is in the form of a taxes will be deducted and given to the government that is basically the concept of tcs and tds government of india in the budget of 2020 announced that the credit card expenditures or to be very precise the lrs because credit card is part of lrs now so the lrs expenses whenever you cross more than 7 lakh rupees per annum i repeat whenever you cross more than 7 lakh rupees per annum in such cases a tcs will be applicable tax collection at source will be applicable how much initially it was 5% now it has been increased to 20% my dear 
But government of India says, in certain cases, whenever you file your income taxes, you can claim this amount back, whatever you have paid. But again, conditions are there, you do not be worried about it. So these are certain very important points associated with the concept of the government of India announcing the TCS credit card expenditures in association with the concept of liberalized remittances scheme. Now this announcement was done last year ago, um, last year itself. It was, it was supposed to be implemented from the last year. But there was certain opposition, certain concern raised because you are expecting the banks to start capturing all of this data. So that is the precise reason the implementation of this was postponed to be started from the 1st April basically a new financial year. So these are certain important points associated with the article here. Now related to BOP, earlier UPSC in the preliminary examination had asked a question, let's solve it. And as far as I am concerned, this is a very, very simple question, very easy question. Which of the following constitutes a capital account? Foreign loans, foreign direct investment, private remittances, portfolio investment. Foreign loans, yes. FDI, yes. Remittances, part of current account. Portfolio investment, part of capital account. 1, 2, 4 are correct. Right option for the question will be option B, 1, 2 and 4. Let me go to the next article now. The world is wasting 19% of its food as more than 780 million people are facing chronic hunger. This has been published in a report published by United Nations now. To be very precise, United Nations Environment Program. And the title of the report is Food Waste Index Report. The first report, same, title same, that is Food Waste Index. The first report was published back in the year 2021. And the data was given for the year 2019. And the next report, that the second report, has been published in 2024. And the data has been provided for the year 2022. Now, what is the information provided here? And what you should carry for the UPC examination? Point number one, the report states that the amount of food that is being wasted around the world has increased from 17% back in the year or in the first report that was given. Now, it is reported to be 19%. And on an average, if you convert this, on an average, the report says that you, me, everybody, we are wasting on an average 19 kgs of food on annual basis. 79, I mean 679 kgs of food on annual basis. Per annum, we are spending somewhere around 79 kgs of food. That is a very important point. Now, having said so, some of you will make a comparison and realize or come to a conclusion that in such case, it means that we are wasting more food compared to earlier system. The report clearly mentions that there are certain issues regarding data collection. Hence, we do not try to make a comparison with earlier report. But the fact is simple. On an average, all of us per person, we are wasting 79 kgs of food per annum. Point number three, what are the other observations? Is this wastage of food, is it a rich country problem? Because generally there is an association or generally there is a thinking that rich countries because they have a lot of money, they will waste a lot of the food. The report mentions that this wastage of the food is not just associated with rich countries. In fact, all the countries are wasting a lot of food. And the difference between the weightage of the food that is being wasted by the rich and poor countries, hardly there is a difference of around 7 kgs. So it is not just the problem of rich countries, it is everybody's problem. What about the other observation? Most of the food that is getting wasted or more of food that is getting wasted, it is present in urban areas, in cities. In villages, the report says, the food wastage is comparatively much lower because in villages, whatever scraps are left out, these are fed to animals. These are fed to right, the domesticated animals. And in case of cities, the wastage is much, much higher. Now, if there is a wastage of the food, what is the problem? Is there any issue? Is there any concern associated with this? The report mentions, understand this, very, very important issues or concerns. Point number one, whenever you cultivate food, 
you, you can take an example of wheat, you can take an example of vegetables, etc. Whenever you cultivate food, you will use a lot of resources. You will consume a lot of resources such as land, such as various inputs. But when you cultivate food and you waste, it basically means you are wasting a lot of these resources as well. That is the first very important concern. Second very important concern, on one side, we are wasting so much amount of food and on the other side, 783 million people are facing issues of food security. They are facing chronic hunger. So, wastage on one side and hunger on the other side. Point number three, if you just waste the food, obviously the wastage will start rotting. There will be decomposition and that will lead to certain emission. In fact, the report says that if you take the emissions that is caused because of the food wastage, the contribution to the global emissions will be somewhere in the range of around 10%. And if this was a country, it would be one of the largest, in fact, the third largest the country which is in terms of wastage and contribution to the emissions. So these are some of the concerns which have been raised by the report. Now, apart from this, what else has been mentioned? Most of the wastage of the food that you're talking about here comes from households. Around 60%, around 60% of the wastage of the food comes from households. Around 28% comes from restaurants and remaining 12% comes from retail outlets. So these are certain important points associated with the report that is mentioned here. Please go through this. If you ask me, Sir, is there any solution to this? What is the way forward? What should I write in the exam? In fact, in the report itself, they have mentioned that one of the reasons why the food wastage is so high, especially in countries which are hotter, the reason is cold storage facilities. Cold storage facilities is not very well developed. So here is your answer, way forward for this kind of a question. Now, based on this, I've given an MCQ. Consider the following statements regarding Food Waste Index. The first report was published back in the year 2008. Wrong. It is published by UNEP. Correct. Maximum food waste comes from restaurants. No, it comes from households. Third and first statements are wrong. How many of the above statement or statements is or are correct? Right option for the question will be option A. Only one is correct. Let me go to the next article. The government of India is now considering shifting from the concept of minimum wages to living wages. And in this particular connection or in this regard, they are holding certain talks with international labor organization. Now the question arises, what is this concept of minimum wages? How is it different compared to the concept of living wages? And where are we in terms of minimum wages? Point number one. In India, please understand the concept of minimum wages comes under Minimum Wages Act of 1948. Minimum Wages Act of 1948. And if you ask me, sir, what is the minimum wage right now? In 2019, Government of India announced a minimum wage of 178 rupees. But please understand the point here. From one state to another state, from one sector to another sector, whether you are a skilled or right highly skilled or less skilled labor, the wages that are paid to you will differ. And that is a precise reason. Please remember the point here. What are the wages provided across the states will keep on differing. Across industries will keep on differing. And whatever is the minimum wage announced by the government, that is a union government, it's not mandatory, it is not applicable to all the states in India. And that is a precise reason, please remember, Government of India back in the year 2019 introduced and passed a one particular piece of legislation that is wages code. Wages code or code on wages. Although this has been passed by the government of India, states are yet to finalize the rules on it and it is expected that after the elections are over, the code on wages will be implemented. But what is, what is going to be the change with the implementation of code on wages? Once the code on wages will come into force, the government says there will be a national floor level minimum wages. National floor level minimum wages, NFLMW. 
and once the national floor level minimum wages will be announced that minimum wage will become mandatory for all the states to follow that's a very important point please remember but before i go forward if you have read about labor codes you will realize or you will know one point these labor codes have been formed by the government of india after subsuming various other pieces of legislation or earlier laws now if you know which are the legislations or which are the earlier acts which have been merged or which have been brought under the code on wages please do let me know the answer to that question in the comment section now come back to the discussion government of india says that the minimum wages will come under the minimum wages act of 1948 and i said the minimum wages that are announced by the government of india are not mandatory to mandatory to be followed by all the states from one state to another state the minimum wages will keep on differing that is the second point third very important point earlier government of india set up various committees right there was one committee set up in the year 2018 anup satpati committee the anup satpati committee recommended that the minimum wages have to be much higher much more than 300 rupees the committee gave recommendation to government of india in fact even though the minimum wages that was recommended was much higher than 300 rupees it was criticized for not doing sufficient because the demand in the market from various associations labor unions was they should be provided with the minimum wage of at least 600 rupees anyways the recommendations have not been implemented government of india in 2019 increased the minimum wages from 176 rupees to 178 rupees in 2021 they set up one more committee they set up one more committee to look into this but the time period for that committee which has been provided that is mr ajit committee the time period that has been provided is for 3 years to 20 2021 plus 3 we are we are waiting for the committee to provide the recommendations this is basically the evolution of the minimum wages or the concept of minimum wages in india but having said so what is being discussed in the article now what is being discussed government of india says rather than following the concept of minimum wages i want to shift to a new concept that is living wages and what is the idea of living wages minimum wages decides how much wages should be provided to you based on the work that you do based on the productivity etc but on the other side the concept of living wages the wages are decided based on standard of living quality of living how much should be the money that should be paid to you wages that should be paid to you in order to ensure that you will be able to get a b c d that is food clothing health care education etc if that is accounted and based on that wages are decided that is basically the concept of living wages so government now says we want to shift from the concept of minimum wages to living wages now we we'll have to wait and see what formula will be used will there be any other committee set up associated with this etc etc so these are certain important points associated with the article let me go to the next article government notifies bonus for postal rural postal life insurance schemes for financial year 25 very peculiar article or very peculiar scheme why generally whenever you read about schemes of government of india most of the times the the schemes which are there in the newspaper will be associated with manufacturing will be associated with exports will be associated with agriculture sector etc but here is a right a set of schemes or pair of schemes which have been announced by the government very very long back both of them are associated with life insurance life insurance and some of you might simply say but sir very recently also many schemes have been announced by the government to provide certain social welfare these are very very old schemes in fact the first one pli and when i say pli i'm not talking about production linked incentive here i'm talking about postal life insurance postal life insurance this is a pli i'm referring to right so postal life insurance as a concept or as a scheme was announced by the government back in the year 1884 please remember this 1884 right so initially it was announced and under this the coverage was very minimal or very restricted that is only the postal workers were supposed to be covered under this but over a period of time it was changed in 1888 
the coverage has kept on increasing and fast forward to 2022 government of india has announced that the postal life insurance the pli any individual can have the coverage can get the coverage of life insurance by subscribing to the eight products because the under the pli that is postal life insurance they are providing eight kinds of insurance products so even individuals can subscribe to the products or insurance products which are provided by pli now in addition to this postal life insurance there is one more rpli what is this rpli it is basically rural postal life insurance rural postal life insurance one is a normal one and the other one is targeting the rural population especially women workers women unorganized labor etc so we have a pli we have rpli how much is the insurance coverage in case of pli the maximum insurance coverage is a 50 lakh rupees and in case of rpli which was announced in 1995 this one is 1884 and this one is 1995 the coverage is maximum 10 lakh rupees so these are the basic points what has been announced by the government bonus for postal and rural life postal life insurance has been announced for financial year 2025 that is basically for the current financial year now what is this bonus here and there is a particular term here reversionary bonus reversionary bonus right what is this idea for reversionary bonus please listen to me very carefully whenever you purchase an insurance product of this sort the government which is basically the owner will announce the bonus on the units that you have purchased they will announce bonus on the units that you have purchased and the bonus that is announced can be two types one is called as a normal reversionary bonus where certain percentage of bonus will be announced for example imagine you have purchased a unit worth 100 rupee and right or the coverage worth 100 rupee and if the reversionary bonus is 4 percent then you will be provided with bonus of 4 rupee there is one more type of a bonus compound reversionary bonus that is in simple terms from one year to next year we will compound the value we will increase the value right basically by a percentage and on that value we will be providing or we will be announcing a bonus so in a nutshell if the percentage is same four percent in case of a reversionary normal reversionary bonus every year assuming it is being announced every year you will get four rupees but if it is a compounded reversionary bonus from one year to next year you will keep on earning more and more bonus that is basically the concept of reversionary bonus that is announced by the government and in this case in this example it is a simple reversionary bonus normal one not compounded one now although the insurance sector has been opened up it has been liberalized now when i say liberalized there is a very important event that is associated with the insurance sector that is a question second assignment for you please do let me know when was the regulator regulator for the insurance sector insurance regulatory development authority of india when was it established because the establishment of this authority paved the way for liberalization of insurance sector in india and that is the reason you will see today there are a lot of private sector companies as well as government owned entities which are providing you the concept or let's say the products associated with insurance now associated with this particular point there is one more very important point although there is a liberalized system now we have liberalized the insurance market even today the pli as well as rpli they are very popular on annual basis they have experienced a growth rate of around 14 percent what is the reason behind it is there any particular argument in favor of these types of insurance schemes when we have already so many other types of insurance service provider the reason behind it is the article says point number one because the postal life insurance basically means the postal department it is owned by government of india there is a very high confidence on the subscribers on the customers here so the customers have very high confidence because of the government association in these kind of products point number two over a period of time the customers have been asked or have been provided with the facility of making a payment through online modes itself because the customers are very happy now in terms of making premium payments etc 
over the online system rather than having to go to physically to the post offices to get the insurance premium paid, the adoption also has been much, much higher. And the third, the article says, or even the government of India's document says, the whole process of a grievance redressal or let's say claiming of the money, etc. has been made much more smoother. And these are the three very important reasons why these kinds of insurance products of postal department are actually experiencing a very high growth. So these are certain important points. Please go through the article. Next article, China vows to treat foreign firms equally. What is this argument of treating the foreign firms equally? Please understand this. Under World Trade Organization, under WTO, there are different principles. What are the principles? The most important one, which we have been discussing from the last couple of weeks, is the concept of most favored nation, MFN. In addition to the concept of most favored nation, there is one more very important principle of WTO that is called as national treatment. National treatment. Now, what is this idea for national treatment? Please understand this. In case of national treatment, the basic idea is whenever a product enters into the country, I repeat, whenever a product enters into the country, it shall be treated in the same way as is the treatment provided to the domestic product. What do you mean by this? Imagine this marker is imported or this stylus is imported into India from USA. And there are many other companies in India which are also manufacturing a similar marker. So government of India shall treat the imported marker as well as the domestically manufactured markers in the same way. There shall not be any policy. The government shall not have any bias in favor of domestically produced companies and against the imported product. This is basically the concept of national treatment. And although I'm giving an example of a product here, please understand this. The concept of national treatment is applicable even to intellectual property rights. It is applicable to even services. And that is the reason the concept of national treatment is mentioned in case of GATS. It is mentioned in case of TRIPS. It is, it is mentioned in case of TRIMS as well. So under those laws, which are most important laws or agreements under WTO, the MFN as well as national treatment, both are actually mentioned. Now, what is the issue here? The issue is that in the last couple of years, there has been certain issues with respect to the policies that are implemented by the government of China. Various foreign companies are alleging, they are complaining that the policies of government of China are targeting the foreign investors, are basically harassing the foreign investors. For example, let's say a government will implement a policy wherein you will have, right, let's say, uh, the, the lot of uh, regulations applicable to the foreign products which are entering. Service providers, foreign company service providers are present in your country. You will eye them or you will basically treat them like, let's say, they are agents of the foreign governments, etc. So, Espionage Act, provisions of that, they have been imposed on many of these service providers. Many of the service providers are the companies in China, foreign companies, mind you, they are complaining that it is increasingly becoming very, very difficult. Raids are being conducted. Right? They are, the company officials are being harassed, etc. So, citing this, the government of China now says they will be treating all the foreign companies equally, which means essentially the government of, in, government of China spokesperson now is saying that we will extend the concept of national treatment. We will provide the concept of national treatment to all the foreign companies which are working in China now. Right? Essentially, he is saying we will treat them in the same way that we are treating the domestic companies. We are not going to harass them. We are not going to push them into, let's say, the pressure as such. And there is a reason. There is a particular reason why China is changing the stance like this. There is a particular reason. In recent times, Government of USA has been tightening its regulation over what is being exported to China, especially products which can be utilized in the defense sector. And not only this, China in the last one year, last one year, because China is one of the major countries in terms of receiving FDI, in the last one year, the inflow of FDI into China has contracted, mind you, contracted, which means compared to last year, 
in this year uh, reference year the fd has actually come down which is a cause of concern for the government and if you are reading newspaper you will also know that there are certain concerns regarding the economic activities uh, or economic activity of chinese market right now so looking at all of these factors now government of india i'm sorry government of china says we want to attract we want foreign companies to come and set up manufacturing units in china etc and in order to facilitate that what we will be doing is we will be treating the foreign companies just like we treat the domestic companies that is we are going to extend the national treatment to them now how they are going to do that those details were not given by the spokesperson so we'll have to wait and see in what way the chinese government will be walking the talk here so these are certain important points please go through them next article gem may offer works contracts now what is this idea for gem gem stands for government e marketplace i repeat gem stands for government government e marketplace e marketplace this idea of a government e marketplace was introduced by the government back in the year 2016 and the whole idea was simple the government of india wanted to increase the transparency sir where they wanted to increase transparency for example let's say there are various departments of the government which want to procure goods from the market so there can be a situation wherein there can be a bribe which is taken by the government official i'm not saying government officials did that i'm saying there could be a possibility there could be harassment of the suppliers there could be opaqueness where other sellers will not know what is the price or what process is being followed by other ministries etc accountability will also be not very high because the whole system is very opaque so government of india looking at all of these systems or problems associated with the system announced in the 2016 introduction of government e marketplace under government e marketplace the central government authorities central government ministries companies owned by government of india etc plus same apply to state government as well all of them will be buying the required goods through a portal called as or a platform called as government e marketplace and what is the advantage of this platform that has been proposed and set up by the government now all the sellers can participate and start tendering for these goods which are demanded or which are to be bought by the government ministries or government companies there will be a better pricing mechanism here everything is much more transparent and if government of india is buying all the goods that they require through the government e marketplace itself competition will be much higher they will be able to purchase the goods at much lower price it will help government save money compared to earlier system so citing all of this jam i am using the short form now gem jam has been set up and what are the important points in the current affairs the important point is the jam platform for the first time has achieved 4 lakh crore rupees worth of sales on this jam platform 4 lakh crore rupees worth of sales has been conducted and the officials are saying this compared to last year compared to last year it's more than the twice the amount compared to last year it's more than the twice the amount that is last year it was less than 2 lakh crore rupees this year it is right more than 4 lakh crore rupees so jam as a platform is yielding very good results point number 1 point number 2 now they are thinking two things one can we conduct a pilot project can we conduct a pilot project where even small buyers such as you and me because right now we are not present we are not allowed to participate in the jam platform why i want to purchase 2 kg of rice jam is not for that you want to purchase let's say 5 kg of onion jam is not for that so right now customers such as you and me we are not allowed to participate for buying now they are thinking can we run a pilot project where individual customers they also can purchase the goods using the jump platform and second right second point that they are thinking of is can we use the jump platform even to offer work contracts what do you mean by work contracts imagine a school has to be constructed in a part of a certain state right now the participation of that for bidding for that project participation is very limited very rural or let's say very reserved players are bidding for it 
Now, what if I if I start offering these work contracts on the junk platform itself? Even those companies or let's say even those service providers or goods providers which are in a different state, now they can start participating for these projects, bid for these projects which will promote competition as well as participation of smaller regional players or other players can also participate in this. So these are certain very important points which are being discussed in the context of government a marketplace. So these are the various articles that are important for civil services in this week. If you like this initiative, please hit the like button, provide your valuable comments in the section below. And if you yet to subscribe to our YouTube channel, kindly do it now. Thank you. Have a great day.